Today is going to be the first real test because this is where my week starts to get properly messy because I need to get to the tiny house, work on it, record everything, start editing all before I then go and do my normal day job, which isn't really a normal day job because I work for myself. So there is a little bit of flexibility in that, meaning I don't have to be at a desk at 9 a.m. But nonetheless, all of this YouTube stuff needs to get done outside of my normal work which is going to be very challenging and when I say I'm going to do something I always stick to it. I just have a real problem with people who say things and then just don't do them so every single day of December I am going to attempt at uploading a video. Now the good thing is with the fact that I'm self-employed it means that I can order materials throughout the day and kind of sort out all of the next amount of work that I need because when I used to work in the city I'd have to leave my desk go find somewhere where no one could hear what I was saying and just start ordering a load of materials to sites. Anyone who has done even a little bit of renovation whilst having a day job will know how challenging it is to kind of juggle everything and always be thinking a little bit ahead and that is another reason why I don't think I'll ever renovate or buy a terraced house again is the fact that when you order materials you need to make sure that you've got a parking space free it's a real nightmare and especially in some boroughs where i've heard about people getting a ten thousand pound fine if they left a pallet on the pavement so anyone who's going through that stuff right now i do not envy you at all detached houses houses with off street parking it makes your life so much easier because i can be away from the tiny house and still get stuff delivered to it so the plan for today is to install the remaining outstands on the tiny house i have got four of these skylight windows and one of them is in perfectly it's all at the correct angle and that one is ready to go and this is something that i don't want to rush because when i'm rushing it i tend to make mistakes unfortunately it's been seriously rainy the last couple of days and that is showing to be the importance of windows on your house because rain does not fall vertically it gets carried by the wind and in certain places the rain manages to get into the tiny house by about a meter and a half so if you were just doing normal insulation and then tongue groove chip floorboards you really want to have the windows in before you do that because otherwise all of that rain will then just get trapped in your wood flooring and it wouldn't be the end of the world if it's for a short period of time but if it was over a long enough amount of time it would start to damage that flooring now the good thing is is i have got marine grade plywood which basically just think of it as being super water resistant it's a little bit over the top the people i've spoken to have said that you really don't need to do this but after a little bit of haggling it wasn't actually that expensive anymore i mean it was still 50 quid a sheet but compared to 120 quid a sheet that is definitely a lot better when it comes to installing your floor, there is something you really, really need to remember. And that is that you are not as accurate as the factory. There is literally zero error in the boards. And therefore that means when you lay them, they can all be perfectly put up against each other. However, that is not true because you are the error. I personally have not seen someone build a house that is perfectly square. Something always goes wrong, usually. Even with the best will in the world, there's a slight error. And that error will only get worse as you continue laying the floor. Now, the way you overcome this is remembering these key things. You run the boards long ways going the long way of your house. Now, the reason you do this is so you only have to cut the short side of the plywood. It's a lot easier than cutting the entire two meter distance. The main thing you've got to remember is starting correctly. And as you can see, there was a one centimeter gap between the plywood and the stud wall. But there's one more thing that I always do, which is think, can I make one cut instead of two, which will save you time and therefore effort. And that is, you've got to remember that when you make this cut, it's now going to shift the board closer to the wall. Now you need to make sure that the end of the board is landing halfway across a floor joist. The reason you do this is so there is no movement in the board when you're walking on it. So what I do is from that new line that I've drawn, I just measure the distance from the stud wall to the halfway point at around where I want the board to then land apply that measurement so you can create a new line and therefore you only need to cut once. Now from this point, all of the boards should in theory all work out pretty well. The other things you want to keep remembering is to add a gap around the perimeter of your footprint. That is a kind of expansion gap. It's more important when you're doing tongue and groove chip wood flooring, but it still does apply to this. The other thing is remembering to lay it in a brick fashion so it's all staggered so that means you've got to start from a full board well on the next row it is going to need to be half of a sheet of plywood something also that is definitely worth doing is just marking where 
the floor joists are and this is important when it comes to things like stud walls and i've put a little bit of thought into this because i think that the first stud wall should be the one that is next to the bathroom because i want to kind of separate that area from the rest of the house because that is going to be a complete and utter mess. I still need to actually order the window for that bathroom. I don't know why I haven't done that. So that I need to sort today. But there will also be a cement mixer in that room because I need to lay the concrete slab for the bath sort of area thing. Now, if you can remember back in time, I put double joist where the walls go. The reason you do that is so it can carry the weight of an entire wall because, well, that's quite a lot of four by two. And then with plasterboard and tiles on top of it, yeah, it quickly starts to get very heavy. Also, if the footage ever jumps around a lot, it's because I have to stop recording and then I'll be on the phone for something or other. And around about now, is when I started to not really pay attention to what I was doing on the tiny house. And I started sorting out the day ahead because we currently have two five bedroom houses going through planning permission on a plot of land. So that stuff kind of takes the priority. I am really trying my absolute hardest to film as much as possible and stick to uploading every single day of December, which is a real challenge because what you lot see is the work on the tiny house. But let me just tell you that editing is what takes up quite a lot of time because I didn't do media at school. Instead, I did photography and I got an E in that. And then I did woodwork at GCSE as well. Got a U in that, which is kind of funny now considering that I build houses nowadays. And in actual fact, just thinking on Substack, which is my weekly newsletter, I'm going to actually explain every single stage of developing these two houses. Every single step process of going from the point of finding the land, the planning process, the stages of the work, I'm actually going to explain every single level. As along with everything else, there is an entire medieval town currently for sale in Italy, which if there was 140 of us and we all put 10 grand into a pot, we could all buy this medieval village, which has in total, 10,000 meters squared of internal house space, meaning that is not the land amount, that is the kitchens and bedrooms of all of these houses. It's actually pretty incredible. And this could be a new way of thinking where if we all work together, we can get more than if we all act singularly, singularly, singularly. Okay, I can't say that word, but you get the picture. Like, for example, the London project, that house was one point something million. We ended up paying 977,000 for it, but we didn't because we got a triple mortgage, got a deed of trust written up. So it means that my brother, his girlfriend and me could all buy a house together. That means that you're paying a third of the deposit, a third of the mortgage repayments. I think it's an absolutely brilliant way to get onto the property ladder. The only issue is there's risk involved. For example, if I decided I didn't want to live there anymore, well, then an issue would arise. And that is why you get a deed of trust written up, which kind of saves you from all of that stuff. And I've always had conversations with my friends where it's like, if we can all work super hard for the next amount of years and we can make X amount of money, we could all actually one day disappear and buy somewhere that's dirt cheap and live in our own world. So I've put a link in the description. Sign up now to access all of this stuff. And if you've enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe if you're new. And as always, I will see you next tomorrow.